Today, I'll be sharing with you something disturbing. I mean, if I've got it wrong, then maybe it's okay. If I've got it right, then it's not going to look good. I'm putting on my investment hat because this research has really brought me to some questions about this particular company, Capital Infrastructure Trust. Now, maybe I'm salty about it because the REITs I own, they have crashed 20% right in the last six months, as you can see over here. KIT, share price relatively stable versus Maple Tree Industrial Trust versus Suntech REIT versus Escort REIT. Capital Infrastructure Trust definitely looks a lot more stable. Their CEO is also making a lot of changes, making big acquisitions here and there. Or maybe I'm salty because uh, KIT is reporting increment in distributable income again. Wow. And a bit like Capital DC REIT, I keep saying that uh, it's not my choice, it's not my choice, but they keep paying higher and higher dividends. So if you are curious about what's disturbing me, or especially if you are a KIT shareholder, or if you are serious about learning about investments, I think this video is for you. Hi guys, welcome back. Today we'll be discussing about Capital Infrastructure Trust and I'll start this whole discussion by firstly explaining what are its assets. Second part, I'll be explaining what's disturbing to me. I'll at least explain not just one, but actually two points which I've picked up doing a deep dive into this company's books. The third, I'll be sharing with you my interpretation of where KIT is heading towards and I'll be drawing my conclusions. But as always, this is not investment advice. This is me sharing my research. And if I've gotten anything wrong, do always look at annual reports yourself. Do always check with their own investor relations. Now, without further ado, let's start with the first point. Explaining a bit on KIT's assets to you because just in case you haven't seen the previous tutorial I've done before, I've actually deep dived into it, but let me show you what is newest assets. Over here, this is recently released as of October 2022 and gives the portfolio overview up to 9 months for 2022. You see right now that they have three categories, energy transition, environmental services, and distribution and storage. Energy transition, this is where they are making a lot more new investments. They've recently invested big into Aramco Gas Pipelines Company. They've also invested big into wind platforms in Norway, Sweden, and if I'm not wrong, Germany also. So City Energy right at the top, you realize that actually gives you know power to Singapore plants. What about for environmental service? You see uh, wastewater plants and stuff under Sunoco, under Tuas, under Sink Spring de desalination plant. And right at the bottom, you see distribution and storage, and the biggest contributor actually sits there, Ixom. This is actually acquired in 2018. And if you were to look in terms of the overall contributions to operations uh, profitability, you realize that Ixom actually provided about $85 million worth of income to the trust itself, and that amounts to about 43%. Very big, correct? But actually, KIT is looking to sell this away. So if you're curious, continue watching. I'll be explaining uh, bit by bit in this story flow. Then if we move up next, what are the bigger contributors to overall income, especially if you're a KIT investor? That actually comes in the environmental services. These four plants are actually big contributor to distributable income. In combination, they provide about 37% of total income. The water plants are quite small in terms of contribution. So the big one is actually Sunoco WTE plant and Tuas WTE plant. If you look in terms of the description, you realize that Sunoco actually is about four times the size of Tuas, correct? And without being able to find real breakdowns of numbers, my estimates are that Sunoco plant actually contributes more than half of this 37% distributable income to the trust itself. So let's put it as a ballpark figure, about 20% of contribution comes from Sunoco WTE plant. I need you to take note of this. I need you to take note of the part where it's mentioned over there. The NEA's concession will end in 2024. I'll explain a bit more on that. Then who is the next biggest contributor? That is actually on top in the energy transition, which is Kepper Malimau Kojan. Let's short form this as KMC. Now KMC, if you look at it, is a plant whereby it produces electricity and its customer is actually Kepper Electric. So if you are using Kepper Electric, this is the plant that creates it and it sells with a fixed contract to Kappa Electric who sells the energy power to you. So this plant actually came about because KIT was actually merged with City Infrastructure Trust. That was actually done many years back, even long in 2014. Back then, KMC was acquired in this structure and they also had to take up a loan of $700 million. Later, I'll be explaining more on this, which is a bit 
of a touchy subject. This 700 million bank loan was actually successfully refinanced in year 2020 for seven more years. So it's a very interesting format as to how this loan is going to get amortized. And since it's a big point, I will start my critique of what's coming up right now. Now, uh, again, this is not any recommendation. And let me invite you to smash your like button early because you know I have the goods and this will help reach a bigger audience together. This research is a very niche topic. I'm always very concerned whether I do a niche topic is worth the time or not. But when I do deep research like this, it takes me at least 10 hours. You heard it, 10 hours of work. So just help me tap, help me smash on the like button. This could be my biggest masterpiece or it could be my worst research ever. You decide and time will tell whether it is one way or the other. This actually got me started in digging into the books. I found that analysts were asking about repayments of KMC's loan that may result in negative distributable income from KMC. Now, management has explained that they will be setting aside amounts to partially amortize this loan from June 2023 onwards all the way to June 2027. And they did not explain further. They just mentioned that they will be looking to replace the contributions from other assets. Again, KMC's contribution to the total trust is about 23%. So it's a very sizable amount. That figure is about, let's put a ballpark, about $14 million. Now, if we look in terms of the debt maturity profile, this is what can be found. You realize that from next year onwards, 2023, there'll be $88 million that would be needed to pay off to amortize that loan because $700 million, correct? 50% needs to be paid off from 2023 to 2026. 88 million, 88 million, 88 million, 88 million. And last but not least, 350 million, one bullet repayment. This was the special structure that KIT kind of got away with because first three years, it was only paying interest. It wasn't amortizing that loan at all. So if you were to see, I even summarized all the refinancing in the bottom part of this image over here to really show you what is upcoming in terms of loans. Because as always, this is a trust that buys assets. Some portions are loans taken on in the trust and some portions are taken on the subsidiary itself. Let me show you why I believe that the loans are in majority taken on the subsidiary level. In my understanding, KIT is like a holding company whereby its subsidiaries all are companies and they take on loans themselves. So everything is ring fence in the subsidiary level. Because if we see in the borrowings, you realize that the group has about $1.9 billion of loans, correct? Loans are very sensitive right now. We are in a high interest rate environment. But the trust itself only has $400 plus million. So whatever loan is taken on a subsidiary level and then whatever remaining cash flows, they paid upwards towards KIT as a trust. And then that's where we get as investors. So this starts the discussion because if we were to look in terms of the segment information, you realize that why I've circled in green, KMC, is only providing 43.8 million, correct, in terms of funds from operations. I don't know how a 88 million is going to get absorbed over here. Maybe it's part of the calculation, I don't know. But that's why the analyst has mentioned, would there be negative distribution? In fact, negative distribution on subsidiary, they go bust, never mind. It's ring fence at that level, in my understanding. Or maybe there are certain amortization already factored in because we also see 77.7 million dollars of cost there. So let's put it prudently because management has mentioned that there's no negative consequence to it. Maybe this will become a very small contributor or net zero. No more profits to the trust itself. Maybe that's a possible outcome and that's only going to be reviewed as we approach 2023. But the big concern again is if KMC is unable to produce distributor income, that means this 43.8 million contribution is gone. Big problems on filling this gap. Could that lead to a drop in dividends, that's something that we need to critique as investors. But the problem does not end there. I mentioned that I've picked up on two parts and when I went to look deeper, I even saw an analyst ask about this. The concessions will end for Sunoco WT plant in 2024, correct? What are his plans to extend concession? Management has suggested that they are looking to explore and discuss with NEA, but they can only do so at the end of the concession. That got me thinking, is there a good chance of it? Because again, Sunoco WT plant, the concession lease will end in 2024, correct? That's just one over a year away. And then what I mentioned just now, it contributes 20% of distributor income. KMC with a problem, 23% is going to be lost there, possibly. 20% from here, if they are to kick in, big problems. But when I think about it, could short-term extension come in? Is that a possible solution? But even if it is, it's still not a permanent solution because you mentioned short-term. Uh, and he could say, okay, run it for another three years, five years. We don't know. Nothing is concrete yet. 
But if you look in terms of description, this Sunoco WTE plant is the only waste incineration plant located in the northern part of Singapore. Almost everything else is in Tuas already. You know when we see government's plan, we always see big picture thing. Singapore government is good in that sense. When we plan, we plan long term. And it seems on the surface to me as, as a layman that everything is moving towards Tuas area. What is the benefit of NEA renewing this lease rather than replacing it and getting something in the West which is fitting of the master plan? That is my big question mark. If the lease is not extended, then it's 20% also going to get lost. So everything I described over here seems quite gloomy. 23% that could fall off because of amortization loan. 20% if lease not extended, also lost. Could that be a looming distribution income drop? Should KIT start to preserve cash and cut dividends right now? Because right now dividend yield is 7.37%, correct? And the funniest part is KIT has actually raised dividend instead of preserving cash or lowering expectations, which could naturally impact sentiment and share price. Not just that, it's been pouring money to make big acquisitions here and there. On paper, everything looks nice. That's something Kappa DCV has also done a lot of acquisition. And right now, climate again, uh, what I mentioned, interest rate going up, market is not too favorable in big acquisition moves. So Kappa Infrastructure Trust has bought wind platforms has bought a korean plant and they've also made a aramco gas investment all in all with all these acquisitions without deep diving into each of them and the numbers let's take it on face value all these could provide 72 million dollars of pro forma ffo ffo uh, is not profit uh. later at the end of this video i'll explain again why kid has such funny terminology if we assume that they are going to use 40 percent debt which are why i boxed up free cash flow and then to also use equity funding which means they need to sell rights possibly at 54.2 cents right now kit is below 54.2 cents which means they might need a bigger sale of equity that's a consequence of things all this being done is only 72 million dollars in pro forma ffo what does this tell you is this 72 million going to cover the 23 percent lost quite possibly from kmc's contribution and the possible 20 percent they'll drop off from sunoco woodlands plant if that were to come true i don't think this 72 million is adding to the books in fact it's just a partial replacement of lost pro forma ffo and when it comes to setting off rights you know markets are very sensitive right now we're in a bear market could that also be driving KIT to look for funding elsewhere so they don't need to sell rights and issue shares on the cheap which will cause distress in share price? Could that be a reason why they are keen to market Ixom? Because it's quite clear that Ixom is on the market already for quite a long while. This is in March 2022. They've been trying to sell this asset even though, like what I mentioned at the start of the video, it provides 43% of total distributable income. Maybe this asset is needed to pay off bridging loans for buying all those windmills and stuff. Maybe this asset is needed to really stave off issuing rights which will cause certain negative sentiment from the market itself. So coming to here, let me share with you what I interpret from KIT as well as my conclusions. Again, these are my personal views and hopefully it's just food for thought for you, especially if you're an investor. It's quite clearly, firstly, that KIT is aggressively pursuing assets. The trust itself, as what you can see over here, is aiming to grow to $18 billion within the next decade. That is a very aggressive target. Good to have, but when you're buying assets, that means two things. Either A, you need to take on more long-term debt to make acquisitions, or B, you need to sell more rights. There is just no other way to raise capital to buy assets in any form or what. And as we can see over here, right now, non-current liabilities, which is long-term debt from the trust itself, has ballooned up by $300 million already. Previously, it was $199 million. Now, it's at $498 million. Total non-current liability borrowing. All this is part instead to grow towards this portfolio of $18 billion of assets. That is a way to grow assets because if we were to look in terms of equity yield right now, KIT is providing 7.37% yield. How are you going to find assets you know that are yield accretive with 7.37% possible if the assets are very short-lived they are not freehold assets make sense which means if you buy an asset that is going to expire in a definitive year then maybe you can squeeze more than 7.37% to be yield accretive if you buy properties you know you, then very often they are freehold US data centers are freehold and stuff you realize 737 you can't find it in the market. That is a rock and a hard place that KIT, in my opinion, is facing. Let me recap again on what KIT 
format actually is. KIT Trustee Manager is actually KIFM, Capital Infrastructure Fund. And KIFM actually is a wholly owned subsidiary of Capital, which means their profits flow to Capital, they report to Capital. And they've recently actually changed their fee structure. And if we were to examine what that is, that means from now on, shareholders like us will need to pay 10% per annum of distributable income as proposed base fee. Now, uh, that means that the bigger they grow, the more fees is being paid, correct? That is a possible conflict of interest. The second part, proposed because what we want as investors is DPU growth, dividends per unit. You don't want the asset base to be 80 million and then keep reducing your dividends. That's not beneficial to you. You want more dividends per unit, then you benefit as a shareholder. But that is also implied in the new fee structure, 25% per annum of increments in DPU. If that is achieved, there is win-win and there's more paid to the trustee manager. With this new fund structure, I took notice also that the total fees to KIT and holding company, even though it's mentioned at the bottom that there's more finance costs, has actually ballooned. It's grown up by 38.6% on a nine month basis. Wow, could that be due to more fees? And could that be a motivating factor as to why DPU was increased, even though operational numbers look to be weaker? Again, as shareholders, we need to think critically whether that is to our benefit or not. Distributable income has fallen by 5.3% as mentioned in this snapshot. Why is there a desire to increase the dividend payout? The second conclusion I have on KIT, my personal conclusion again, is that KIT is again pursuing the same type of assets. They've been pursuing infrastructure assets and take note again, infrastructure assets are not the same as properties in a lot of ways. When REITs buy assets, industrial assets are 60 years, 99 years, overseas ones are freehold, which means you own it, there's no urgency of, of it to be sold off, it doesn't decay, you don't need to amortize it every year kind of thing. So REITs are in a much better position. Bad cycles hold on, good cycles trade it away, make paper profits. But KIT's assets are depreciating. These assets have a much shorter finite lifespan. Let's use this energy. When you buy a REIT, it's like you owning a car park. When you buy KIT's assets, in my understanding, it's like owning a car and having a car business because that is the infrastructure, the car, sitting on the land, the car. This car is leased out to Grab drivers and usually the rent collected from the Grab drivers is fixed. A lot of KIT's water contracts and uh, electricity contracts are fixed contracts. Inflation high, this fixed contract don't benefit. Deflation cycle, then this fixed contract makes sense. So the cycle also impacts. But back to the story, KIT is like a business owning cars and leasing it to grab drivers. But what do we know? This car depreciates, correct? In Singapore, there's a 10 year COE, which means when the car gets older and older, we need to mark down that COE value along the years, which means 7% rate of return well, on a KIT asset is typically some parts a return of capital, not a return on capital. There's a big difference to it. And that's why KIT has never really recognized any profits in its P&L. And therefore they've come up with this FFO definition for distributable income. Right now they're buying win assets again. And from the looks of it, the lifespan of this win assets are 31 years for the long one and only 20 years for the shorter one. We are going to run into the same problem if these assets get too short lived in terms of lifespan. Because previously, these power plants were 20 years, but now it's at the tail end of things really. KIT buying assets with 20 years lifespan is going to possibly run into a similar situation in future. And just now I mentioned, if Ixom is sold away to pay off bridging loan and to avoid rights issues, then there's again a big gap in terms of distributable income coming from assets. Now with that, I'd like to share with you some wisdom from Warren Buffett. He's mentioned something. Time is the friend of a wonderful company, the enemy of the mediocre. In my opinion, this is my assessment. I could be right, I could be wrong. Leave them in the comment sections whether you agree or not. And hopefully this has spurred more critical thinking on how to evaluate this particular company. As always, invest well, invest safe. And I'll see you next tutorial. Take care as always. Goodbye.